Right. So yes. So welcome. Um, Sally is saying I'm Christian Hudson uh, from the Improvement, Ca Improvement Academy. Also work in the Yorkshire Humber Applied Research Collaboration. Um, and so this is the lunch and learn today. Um, so I'm talking about impact, um, and I'm going to come at this predominantly from a research perspective. But towards the end, I'm going to involve start talking about the system as a whole. So it's implementing for impact, fixing the disconnect between theory and practice. Um, so I'm really talking about how can we evolve research to achieve impact, more impact. But then I'm going to talk a bit about convening the system as well. So I'll talk about impact in general, a bit about implementation, a bit about implementation science, talk about the research to practice gap that I think exists. Um, go over what I think are the two main causes of this. There are multiple causes, but two ones I think really stand out. A way forward couple of case studies um, and a bit about the system and then hopefully we'll, we'll have some time for discussion as well. So impact, I mean, you could define this in many ways. Um, you can have academic impact, cultural impact, economic, well-being, policy impact, but my role has been to support uh, art projects with implementation science. And I've been thinking about this for a long time. How can we actually make sure we get impact? So the way I've seen it is, how can we make sure projects actually achieve what they set out to? Did X get implemented? If not, why not? Did X achieve its implementation outcomes? What else did X lead to? Was it sustained? These are the sorts of questions I've been asking. And so my focus has been on implementation. And you know, if you don't have, if you don't implement something well, it's not going to benefit the people you're delivering it to. Most likely, it's a bit like the needle in the syringe. You might have the medicine, but without the syringe, you're not, you don't have a good delivery system. So in, in theory, you won't get impact. So that's the way I've kind of think, thought about it. No, it. no good implementation, no impact. Now, we know many implementation efforts fail. So a lot of outcomes are often not met. And so often we're not having the impact we'd like. And so um, you see this across the education sector, the healthcare sector, private sector. Um, we know from some work, you know, 70% of change initiatives fail. And even when you've got a highly developed plan for execution, um, you're still getting a high failure rate. So um, um, you know, what can we do about this, really? That's the question. Now, I've, I've drawn here a very rudimentary uh, yeah. representation of a healthcare system. <clears throat> so within a healthcare system, you're going to have multiple stakeholders. Um, and so, as I say, I will talk about that as a whole. But just to start with, really, I'm going to be focusing on the research side of things. So what role the researchers have and research and implementation have when it comes to getting impact. So a good place to start is probably implementation science. Um, what is that? Can it help us? Um, this is one definition I've put together. There, there are lots of definitions of, of implementation science. This is a recent one. It's healthcare focused, which I think is quite relevant for today. And it's saying it's the study of methods to promote the adoption and integration of evidence-based practices, interventions, policies into routine healthcare and public health settings to improve the impact on population health. So it really is trying to help us you know, promote initial ad adoption. So make sure people take things up, get make, help them make sure they get it into practice and then get those outcomes and get the impact. And it tells us implementation fails because of contextual factors. So there are lots of things in, in the world in the context we're implementing in that can be powerful forces working against implementation in the real world. So we need to understand how to overcome these forces in order to achieve our implementation goals. That's the, the crux of it. So what's it given us over the last 20 plus years? It's given us lots of theories, models, and frameworks. There's now 170 of these. Nilsson here does a great job of categorizing them, three main types. There's proce process models that kind of describe or guide the process of translating research into practice. There are models like determinant frameworks that tell us all the things that help or hinder implementation. And then there's frameworks that help us evaluate it. Um, another thing the science has tried to do is look at testing strategies as well. So they've said, well, let's try training, audit and feedback and see if we can um, use those to get better implementation outcomes. And they've often often focused on Proctor's uh, outcome measures. You may have heard of those. They're these generalizable academic implementation outcomes like fidelity, reach, feasibility, sustainment. So they've looked at that as well. Um, just before I continue, has anyone used an implementation science framework? Does anyone want to be brave and Unmute and just let me know if you've used one. Maybe you use the CIFA or TDF or Paris. I'm not gonna I won't come out of the presentation, but I can see some of you on the side of my screen. 
Anybody want to be brave? I, I know some of you have. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sure some of you have used them. And I was going to really just interested to know if it's how, how useful it was and if it did help you get impact. Um, I'm not going to go over a lot of frameworks today. I'm certainly not going to go over all 170 because that would take weeks. But this is one implementation framework. This is the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. Um, we use this one quite a lot. There's a new version. I'm just showing you the first version today because it's a bit more simple. The new version is great. And this is the, so this is the kind of thing the science is giving us. Frameworks like this, this is a determinant framework. The CIFR is saying, look, all these things can affect implementation. There's five domains saying, look, characteristics of your intervention you know, will affect implementation. So the evidence strength, the quality of the evidence. So you know, if you're working with doctors, they're often very keen to know what the evidence is for something before they, they use it. So what's their perception of that? Is it Do they think it's got good evidence? That will affect implementation. Nurses might want to know, is it better than what's already in place? So that'll be relative advantage. Has it got an advantage over what they're already using? Can you adapt it? Can you trial it? How complex is it? What's the cost? Th those sorts of things. Inner settings more about, you know, what are your formal and informal communications like between doctors and nurses, say? Do they have regular team meetings about this, about this intervention, about its implementation? Is there leadership engagement? Is it kept a priority over time? These sorts of things. Outer setting, you know, you can imagine things like financing. You know, is, is there government incentives to do this? Individuals involved, it's a very key part of implementation. What is their knowledge of the intervention? Is it accurate? Do they know how it works and know what it is? And do they believe it's a good idea? You know, do they believe they can use it? And process things are more like, you know, is there a plan in place? Are you engaging people? Um, is there some way of monitoring implementation over time? This is just one of many frameworks um, that you could use. Now, how, how, how do you use these with the science? Well, the idea is you can apply a framework like this to understand your context. And so, and by doing that, you can form a strategy. So this is an example. So Leotard looked at 40 different hospital settings uh, who were trying to implement something and they applied the CIFA to see what factors seemed to matter most. They found that these things mattered most. So leadership engagement was key. They were champions, evaluation, monitoring, feedback, networks, communications, resources, culture. Leadership was really key because it kind of connected all the other things up. So if any of these things were missing, your implementation wouldn't go so well. So you could look at this and say, well, we understand the context of it. Let's make a strategy from this and we should get better outcomes. We should get more impact, right? That's the theory. Um, and there are, there are a whole list of strategies within the science. This is Powell's 2015, it's very well known, uh, Eric strategy compilation. There's, this is not exhaustive by any means. There's, there's lots of strategies you could potentially use, but this is 73. And so you might look at something like this and say, well, we know we need to engage leadership. So, oh, look, there's a strategy, build a coalition, recruit and cultivate relationship with partners in the implementation effort. Let's get leadership together. Now, you can even put a logic model. There's the logic models to help you. This, this one. Now, this was actually great if you've already done implementation, but if you, you could also use it before. So that, so if we wanted to use it before, we'd say, well, we're going to target leadership engagement. We're going to form a coalition. And we think this will work by improving their knowledge and self-efficacy of the intervention and their response to knowledge-related barriers, raise acceptability, increase the likelihood of engagement, sustainment. And the outcome will be that the intervention is implemented and sustained over time. You get more service referrals and less patients left on support. So you can make, it's all logical, right? It makes sense. Um, but let's just have a reflection here. So We've got all these frameworks. You can use them to do all sorts of things, but a lot of the time it's to assess your context or plan implementation or evaluate. Um, and, and this is useful because it's great to have an overarching, overarching strategy and a rationale that's couched in one of these frameworks, or at least maybe multiple frameworks to start with. It's a good starting point. It can help you find useful ways to think about implementation, collect data, analyze data, evaluate and create strategies. But let's be, be honest here. And I've been thinking about this since I started working in this field many years ago. How how was the science actually done? Well, in terms of defining implementation, categorizing it, giving it a common language, uh, raising awareness, I think it's done a great job. I think in, in terms of identifying barriers and facilitators, I showed you with that like Leotel paper, there's hundreds of papers like that showing what barriers are, what the facilitators are for different interventions, different contexts. Strategies, I've just shown you a list of 73 and, and, and it's been good at that. But what about the actual definition we started with? Adoption, integration, impact. Um, I don't think it's really achieved this. Not 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 particularly very well. Um, now, 
And I said, well, what's going on? You've got a science that's dedicated to trying to achieve that and it's not achieved it. So I think, let's have a look. Let's have a think about this. Now, I think there's two causes. Um, there's probably more than two causes, but these are the two that really stand out for me. Now, the first thing is, I'm, I'm highlighting a problem here with research in the system, but later on, we're going to look at the system as a whole. But right now, looking at research, now, why, why are we not getting the same impact? Well, it's not connecting with practice perhaps as well as we'd like. So you're, if you look at this, our rudimentary model of the healthcare system, this is kind of how we've been doing it. You've got all your different um, you know, stakeholders in the system, all these people with valuable knowledge about implementation who are actually doing implementation, doing different things. And the research and the academic research on the outside kind of feeding findings into that system. So you've got your scientific institutions and um, institutes generating a certain type of knowledge and feeding it into practice and you're not really getting much back in the other way uh, and this is this is problematic right because you're starting to see papers like this this is by Alison Metz a good friend of mine um she was on the essential implementation podcast with me not so long ago Annette Boas down in London as well thing is implementation research out of step with implementation practice so we're starting to see people question this um so what we've had, we've had this continued reliance on designs, research designs and measures that emphasize traditional approaches. And it has kind of restricted the research to academic researchers. So what that's done is we've got amazingly good at understanding the problem of implementation. We're great at doing problem analysis. We're great at knowing what barriers and facilitators are, but we've been less good at engaging with how to actually make transformational change happen. How do you do implementation? So a lot of our empirical findings haven't got into practice. And a lot of our research questions and designs have not been sufficiently informed by practitioners. So I think the needs of practice haven't really been met. Um, just to reiterate this, 170 frameworks actually may have increased the gap. Because if you think about it, you may have a matron on a maternity ward who says, I want to know how to implement something. I know, I'll go and look at the implementation science literature. She's then shown 170 frameworks. And I'll tell you now, learning the CIFA or the TDF or MPT or Paris framework or the NAS framework or any of these frameworks, it takes time. It can take weeks and weeks to get good at using them. And I'll bet you any money that the matron won't have time to do that. So this, we've increased the gap in a way, even just by the frameworks. So we need to be asking questions. What do local stakeholders actually need? What's locally significant to them? Again, just to reiterate, this is the kind of papers that we've been producing. Um, this was a barriers and facilitators influencing the sustainment of health behavior interventions in schools and child care services. They amazing piece of work. You know, they've identified 59 barriers, 74 facilitators. They're saying, look, we need to address all these multi-level factors with strategies, executive or administrative support, staff engagement, more internal funding, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But how how do you engage staff? Um, you know, how do you get more resources? Where, where do you engage them? How often? Which staff? You see, the, the problem is when you when you analyze the problem of something and produce barriers and facilitators, you st it's still down to people in the practical settings to come up with dozens, if not hundreds of micro strategies to bring those things to life. So we're not telling them how to do that yet. We, we, we're not learning that so well. Um, now, the second problem. So the first problem is a disconnect. Second problem is complexity, right? And this is, there's been this kind of what they're calling complexity drop recently. As, as people are realizing, because of complexity science coming into the field more, that we've not fully appreciated the complexity of implementation. So this is, this is a kind of mo a model from 2006, which is saying, look, this is how you translate research into practice. You start with your basic research and you go through these steps to get to healthcare delivery. Um, but can you see it's a call? They're saying it's a causal linear process. It's mechanistic. It's step by step. It's cause and effect, right? But the reality is that that isn't reality. When we're when we're working in these non-mechanical human systems, this kind of approach has serious limitations. Um, so, what is the reality? A lot of you will know. We're working in highly complex open systems. So within these systems, there are multiple stakeholders. Varying levels of interest, varying levels of capacity, time, all interacting in different and unpredictable ways. How they interact within their context is locally specific. You're never going to get exactly the same in every context. There are remarkable differences. So there are some similarities, of course, but remarkable differences. So implementation is messy. It's really simple. It's really straightforward. It has to find a place in this intricate pre-existing social environment Implementing a new practice in the same manner across a health system becomes untenable. Check out Penny Hall's work. She talks very well about this. The Braithwaite paper I'm referencing here also talks about uh, complexity science and implementation very well. So just to 
explain this better. Implementation is like raising a child. So that's a complex problem, right? There's loads of uncertainty. You don't know what the problems will be until you start trying. And every day is different. There's no direct transference from context to context. So from child to child, they're all different. Even what, it doesn't matter what an expert tells you, um, you know, your child's probably gonna, it's, it's gonna take time to get to know your child. And actually the success will rely on this continuous adaptation to problems and continuous learning. And instead of experts, you probably need somebody with deep knowledge of contextual dynamics. So in terms of implementation, somebody that's repeatedly tried to implement one thing or multiple things in multiple settings, multiple contexts again and again and again, and they over time learn how to adapt and learn continuously. Anything on the planet in order to survive has to adapt continuously. It's just like with our interventions are the same. So implementation is a complex problem. And that means we have to uh, 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 you know, approach it in a different way to say baking a cake or building a rocket, which a cake is simple. You just follow the recipe and you get the cake. The rocket is very complicated and you need expertise and stuff, but eventually you keep trying and trying and until you've got a protocol and then you can follow that protocol and every time you'll get a rocket. Implementation is not the same as that. This was my, usually in the morning I go and say bye to my son. This morning I found him like this. So you just don't know what you're going to find. And when I tried to remove his pillow, he didn't want me to. He just wanted to stay there sleeping until I didn't get to say goodbye today. But you just don't know what you're going to get from one moment to the next. And it's the same with implementation. So what can we do about this? How might we evolve our research? Now, this uh, chap here is Professor Johan Faisi. Uh, I'm a big fan. He's a climate change professor. And again, I spoke to him on, on the podcast quite a long time ago now. But he wrote this paper in 2018 called 10 Essentials for Action Orientated and Second Order Energy Transitions. Now, what Yohan was saying is he's trying to understand how to solve the problem of climate change. It's a big, complex problem, just like implementation, just like obesity, uh, just like um, poverty or autoimmune disease you know, around the world. All these big, complex issues. How do you address them? And he was saying um, what I was kind of saying at the beginning, that the way the kind of knowledge we've been generating isn't allowing us to answer the problem of something like climate change. He's saying 98% of the papers just talk about the problem and only a fraction talk about implementing solutions. So he's saying we need to change, we need to do what he calls second order research. So we've got first order modes of research are important. The more traditional approach is where you're objective on the outside, not getting involved in what actually happens. But we need greater emphasis on second order approaches that can accelerate learning and actions that lead to transformations. So these 10 essentials, I'm just listing five here. I've reworded them to make it a bit easier. First thing, we need, like I've been saying, we need to move beyond problem analysis. We've done a lot of that. We know what the problems are around implementation. So let's stop analyzing just the problem and let's start researching solutions. That means we need to focus on the how-to, the practical knowledge that's generated in practical settings. That means we need to ensure our research methods engage with practical knowledge and allow practice to inform the research more directly. Um, this means we've got to research within. So it's time to start embedding ourselves in these settings more. Realize that we're part of the system. We're part of the problem. Th this allows for approaches where action and learning are more cl closely intertwined, leading to new opportunities for innovation, learning, and change. That might mean, as a researcher, we have to acknowledge the value of alternative roles. So you know, learning about change requires practical experience and working within the system being studied. So instead of just extracting data, a lot of the work we do now in some of the art projects is we actually can play a role sometimes. We might facilitate the implementation or actually be an active participant. And the final point here, encourage second order experimentation and change. Well, Faisy also realized that transformative change implementation is very complex. This means it's messy. And so you need that process, that iterative cycle of learning, um, action and reflection in any implementation effort and any research around it, because that's what's going to generate the how-to and the practical knowledge. So structured processes are therefore often needed to enhance learning through iterative attempts to create change. And in the Improvement Academy, we have a lot of experts with improvement science expertise who can use improvement practices with people, which are in themselves those iterative cycles of learning uh, to, to generate this and, and get through complex problems. And the good news is there is a lot of people doing this already. So this is Alison Metz again, uh, and she talks about implementation support practitioners. There's a lot of work around this. These are people that support implementation. Um, they could be anybody. It could be a doctor. It could be a member of the public. It, it, you know, anybody that's sort of involved in, in supporting. And she's she's created this um, 
this whole series of skills and, and, and expertise that they'll need. And you can see that she's really highlighting the uh, importance of co-creation and engagement. Engagement's often missed in implementation efforts. It's so important. Co-learning, brokering, ad addressing power differentials, co-design, tailoring support. Um, there's the improvement bit in there as well. So, and the implementation science part. So using frameworks, um, assessing needs, but also she's talking about conducting improvement cycles. And then just to sustain change, growing and sustaining those relationships, developing teams, building capacity. You may have seen all this before, but the fact is there are people out there who are either have these skills or are learning to have these skills and trying to support implementation. And I think these are the people that we need to be targeting when we're doing research because they're learning so much valuable, juicy, practical implementation knowledge. So as I say, lots of people learning how to implement. Change agents, improvement specialists, implementation support practitioners, practitioners on the ground, project leads, and these new people, uh, system conveners, a very interesting area of research as well that um, I've been looking into recently. So we should be willing to engage perspectives of all involved, of course. And this is Gr Trish Greenhouse, you know, one of the key leaders in implementation science. You probably saw her on the TV over the pandemic. This is a, a quote from her. The workarounds, adaptations, articulations and goal changes made in the face of uncertainties, inconsistencies, contextual influences and material challenges need to be captured in all their glory. So if you imagine any sort of implementation effort, there's a whole load of stakeholders in the system. You imagine they're on a ship sailing through the ocean, trying to get somewhere. There's, there's you know, lots of changes in the weather, um, getting lost, maybe sea creatures getting in the way. Um, it's um, they, the, the crew on that ship will have to come up with multiple workarounds, adaptations, articulations in the face of all these challenges. And implementation is no different. So, and 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 these are the, this sort of learning and these occurrences are the star of the show. You know, I think this is what we need to be capturing more. Um, there's approaches to this co-design, quality improvement, PPI. We can learn from these people and processes. And and look, case studies. This is the approach we take now. Studies are to to really do implementation research case studies were seen originally you know as lower down in in terms of quality of, of research you know it was all about rcts uh, uh, and you know, randomized controlled trials gold standard but they don't always give us that externally valid uh, findings it, they're inter they're, they're very careful to ensure internal validity but when it comes to external validity like findings that actually you can use elsewhere that what can you apply elsewhere they haven't been so good so th there's a lot of great work recently uh, these two papers I recommend really arguing for why you should take a case study approach to your evaluations of complex interventions and when you want to understand implementation. And they've even come up with reporting principles so you can to make sure your study really um, follows guidance to be a, a good quality study. Um, but yes, it, they just don't enable the dynamic understanding of the, of the complexity better than, say, an RCT would. Um, they address multiple variables in numerous real life contexts, often where there's no clear single set of outcomes. So they're an important methodology for studying complexity, and I think they're pretty invaluable for understanding the influence of real-world context on complex system-level interventions. Um, so let's look at some examples, because um, I think some of you may have come here today for that to see, you know, what how can we bring all this to life? So just uh, just to give you a, as an overview of a process evaluation. So often, you know, things are implemented, and people want to know how it went, which you can understand. And the traditional approach to that would you'd have your you'd have your evidence based practice, your idea or your concept. It would be implemented over time. Maybe it takes a year or two or three years. And at the end, there'd be an evaluation team that produce, um, you know, an evaluation report, you know, and, and, and traditionally what that's done is it would say, well, it would tell you, was it implemented or not? Where was it implemented? Um, they'd use some of Proctor's measures, uh, these uh, implementation outcomes that are generalizable. So was it acceptable? Um, you know, do people think it was um, acceptable? Did it have fidelity? What was the cost of it? Things like that. And maybe they'd apply a framework so you'd know what the barriers and facilitators were. But knowing those things doesn't tell anyone in the future how to implement this. Um, so what we do instead, we, we see it as an ongoing process of learning and we try and capture the complexity. Now, as I was saying, there's all these frameworks and they're very complicated to learn. And so one way, another way to close the gap, another important thing that we're trying to do is create pragmatic tools that anyone can use to understand implementation. And um, we're not the only ones doing this. There is a, 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 some great people around the world doing this at the moment. So this this frame, this this like diagram here with these four circles is 
originally was created by Gabe and LeMay, who, who were two um, ARC implementation leads up north. And they call it the four circles model. And, and these the, the big circles here, they're just saying most implementation frameworks kind of are saying the same thing. So your intervention, your goal, your context, the people involved in the implementation and how they implement will interact constantly. And they all affect implementation in different ways. And the complexity is that they're all, they're all affecting each other in unpredictable ways all the time. So that's one way to understand implementation. It's these four main things. And so what we try and do, we've added another circle, which is we want to capture the, what we call within system learning. So as these people try and achieve this goal in this context, using whatever method they might use, uh, what do they learn in doing that? So we try and capture that. And we think that that's a lot more relevant to possibly than just knowing various facilitators, what is acceptable, et cetera. So we, we take a rapid approach. Now, this doesn't mean quick and dirty. This means robust. It means that we are in contact with these people regularly. We know in the first week or the first two weeks how things are going. We don't wait till the end to know how it went. And we, we're talking to them regularly to see what within system learning we can pick up. Now, there's a responsive aspect to this because what we learn will feed back to them. So we use these things called lightning reports, um, which have become quite popular. I'll show you one of those in a minute, but we, we, we collect data we summarize it and we feed it back and they can then use that how they want. Because the truth is most people implementing don't have time to actually record stuff like that and reflect on how it's going because they're so busy. Um, now, we think this this finding, the findings we get from this are a bit more relevant too, because now hopefully you've got, you've acknowledged complexity and you've got some kind of practical knowledge you can give, something that's transportable um, that can be given to future sites. Um, so, as I say, we collect and summarize within system learning. We feed that back to people doing the implementation. We feed that back into the effort, generates more within system learning, ideally, and then you carry on. So it's a cyclical thing. Now, uh, what's a real world example of this? Well, I'm not going to focus too much on the intervention here. Don't have time. But it was to tr this was an intervention to reduce ambulance conveyance rates. Basically involved getting lots of different professionals, district nurse, mental health worker, ambulance, person who works for the ambulance crew, all in one room. Um, and instead of sending ambulances to people's houses, they would try and send care to them so they didn't have to go to hospital. So the district nurse might go instead. It was this sort of process. Now, how was this implemented? Well, there was somebody with lived experience, one of these, somebody that's, you know, these um, people that actually support implementation. In this, in this case, an improvement specialist, somebody that knew about improvement practices, things like plan, do, study, act cycles and things like that. He did the engagement bit. It's so important, the engagement piece. You always got to engage everyone, develop those relationships. And he went around doing that. So he spoke to the ICB and said, look, you've got a problem. You know, I know you're under pressure because your, your ambulance queues are, are a problem and, and, and conveyance rates are an issue. And you've got winter pressures coming up. I, this, I've got an intervention that might help you. They said, give us the business case. He said, no, because you're a different setting to the last place. If you just copy their business case, it won't work. Let's let's help you develop your own business case. And the way he said it was, we'll do it through a, what he called a test of change, which use these concepts of rapid improvement. They were all for it. So then he spoke to the service leads. Is this a good idea? Will this work for you? They got to ask him what they what they thought, what they needed. Do you have room for this? He then spoke to the frontline staff. So robust engagement was the, part, the start of this. The test of change, what is it really? I mean, it could be two hours long. It could be five days. It could be a month. But it, instead of trying to persuade people in a already a, a difficult, stressed environment to implement something for a year, you're just saying, let's try it for five days and see. And that's what they did. So it, they all agreed to try it for five days. And they did. And it, it, it started to get what seemed like really good results. Um, now, where's the what's the role of research in this? So you notice we're not telling them how to do this. We're basically saying, we think you you know what you know how to do this already. So we're supporting you to do that. We're going to contact you every couple of weeks as you try and do this. We'll complete the lightning reports and we'll feed that back to you. So now you've got a record of how things are going. We still did more traditional stuff like baseline interviews, interviews at the end, and use the CIFA. But we also use the CIFA on the lightning reports. And um, so what you actually had here was somebody that had developed an intervention that seemed like a good idea, that really understood the context, that knew who to involve, 
and had a method of implementation, test of change. That's a great recipe for success. It's got good potential. We're strong in all these areas and it did get implemented very well. And so there was a great opportunity to, to collect that within system learning. So that's the kind of approach we're taking. Um, now, this is a lightning report. You'll notice it's very simple to read. This is to make it more pragmatic. We want to communicate better with practice. I don't want to give them a full C for analysis, you know, 10 pages, 10 page matrix of all the different determinants. Now I'm giving them just a nice, easy to read report. It's even got an executive summary for people that don't have time to read the rest of it. So they can just get a snapshot of what's going on. And lightning reports are so simple. Anybody could use them. You know, what's going well? What isn't going well? Any key insights? about the implementation effort or the intervention itself. So this is the kind of way we as researchers can support practitioners, develop relationships with them and try to generate that much needed practical knowledge. Another thing we did, this was a, this is a brilliant example, I think of closing that research to practice gap. Um, Michael McCoo, uh, ICU consultant, part of Improvement Academy, co-director of Improvement Academy, Notice that in the Bradford area, there were people coming into the BRI with high blood pressure, young people who, who shouldn't normally have high blood pressure like that, even people having strokes. So they, they they theorize that maybe in some areas around the hospital, people are, don't know they've got a high blood pressure and they need to know. Um, Shahid Islam, this, this this guy in the top here, is what you know we call a community connector. He knows the community, he engages with them, he has relationships, extremely important person to any implementation effort. And he engaged this community and understood a lot of them couldn't even see their GP. So this is the issue. So what um, Kieran, Kieran here is one of our um, leadership fellows. He joined the, he's a doctor as well, joined the IA um, and spent a year doing this. Um, and you've got uh, Zanira Kershid, she's uh, one of our implementation science um, research fellows. So, so if you want to ask her any questions about this, because she's been mostly involved in this, she's on the call. You can ask her. But they they decided they'd do a, a day where they got people to come and have the blood pressure taken. Now, again, highlighting the importance of engagement, crossing boundaries, bringing people together, making this a social change. This so you've got the Improvement Academy here, the clinicians, researchers involved, but there's all these other people. The council are involved. You've got community centres. You've got religious leaders. So they're bringing everyone together. And, and it was a huge success. They, they had This is the first day. They had another one last week, equally as successful. Um, 103 people attended. Now, 61% had abnormal blood pressure and two had to go to hospital the same day. So this is a great example of where you've got practice actually getting impact. And of course, on top of this, the research and we did the same sort of approach. We saw this as a, syst as a journey of learning. We tried to capture within system learning. We used lightning reports. Um, so they, they use community engagement. They use co-production. And we evaluated that using the same approaches. And you can still use frameworks like the CIFA. But look at the, the role here was not for us to tell them how to do this or what to do. It was to help them work out how to do this well, support them to do it, and capture what they learned in the process. And now we've got a lot of practical knowledge that we can give future areas or sites who might want to do the same thing. Um, now, I'm getting near the end, but there's a lot, like I said, a lot of people who know how to implement things. The science keeps trying to answer that question, but if you just go and ask these people, they'll tell you various things. Now, there's something important. The first thing is, I keep talking about engagement because I, I can't stress how important that is. It's often seen in the literature as a kind of soft thing, you know, this, oh, engagement. Um, it's often not funded to go and spend time getting everybody on board. But um, things are implemented through the formal system often. Uh, you'll know this in the NHS. It's top down, you know, um, and sometimes that's, that, that, that works. But very often it won't because you've also got to engage the informal system. So that's the relationships, the influencers, the connectors in the system. So you might have management and exec saying, let's try this. And it gets passed down to the shop floor. But you've got to engage the informal system as well. And anyone with experience of bringing about change and implementation will tell you that. Um, network, organizational network analyses will show you as well that there are these people in the informal system that they call them super connectors, social influencers, um, opinion leaders. They make up about 3%, but they affect 85% of the conversations that go on. So you've got to target those people. because, And often, you know, implementation can fail because leaders don't engage in dialogue with the informal system and they don't engage with these super connectors. There are these people, I was mentioned systems conveners. And there's a book about this. You can, you can, it's, it's free. I'd recommend reading it. Talking about enabling conversations and learning across boundaries in the system. And that that's needed to make a difference. So people will say, you know, I, I speak to 
we've got Ali Cracknell at the Improvement Academy. He's spent years implementing safety huddles. Huge success. So this, you know, start at the bottom of the organization with a group of passionate people who are engaged and alert. Shared purpose. Everyone's got to be on the same page. So you've got to build that trust. You've got to build connections. It's got to be relational, long-term. A lot of implementation projects don't put the time in to do that. So just to show you the difference between formal and informal, you know, as I was saying, you've got this could be your exec at the top here. And the, he's only got real the direct connections to these three. And then it goes down and goes down. And so Cole here is only really being informed about something by one person above them. Whereas if they targeted Cole directly, informally, Cole's connected to everyone, even the exec. So you'd really want to persuade Cole that what you want to implement or, or what you're offering or what you want to try and do is a good idea. Cole may be on board with that, may not be. Uh, if they're not, you've got to try and persuade them. So um, I would argue that we might have more impact if we engage more with the informal system and ensure learning and conversations across boundaries. In fact, people talk today more about, um, you know, implementing sideways. So it's not top down or bottom up, it's sideways, getting these connections across boundaries. So I think with research, I, I hopefully I've demonstrated that we don't always get this right. We don't always work with people in the informal system. We don't find out what they need, what they want, what outcomes they would like. We don't help them. We don't facilitate. We don't include them. Um, it's kind of just coming from the top down. We, we need to start working more sideways and connecting people. And a lot of you will already get this, I'm, I'm sure. Now, just to finish, um, I've said that research forms one part of the system, and I've used it as an initial example of how we might get better impact. We can evolve how we do it. We can deal with complexity and acknowledge that. But I think there are other, you know, can, can we solve other problems in the system with this kind of relational social learning approach? Might we also get better impact that way? Um, well, I think we need everyone in the system to solve problems of the system. And implementation is one of those problems, but there's there's a lot. So it's this idea, as you know, whether it's, a health system or government or the world to, to, to solve these problems we need an integration of many perspectives um we need to include all voices we need to leverage the know-how of experts policymakers practitioners all these people on the ground we need to follow the rules of the formal system but then i think we can be a little bit rebellious and more creative informally so a lot you know in our team what we do we, we, we we're submitting grants we're getting we're doing what the funders would like us to do we're doing ethics you now sometimes ethics delays things by six up to six months but we follow the rules we, we get the ethics you know but then once you've got all that you can work more informally to kind of try things evolve things a bit more that's why we've been using lightning reports and actually getting our hands dirty not just extracting data um but yeah there's so many problems i mean just one other one i came across which I think is a huge problem, is measurement and metrics. So, you know, I think prevention is a great idea, isn't it? it improve, improving well-being, stuff like that's great. Being proactive, proactive in our health system to stop people getting ill in the first place. But the problem is the system, it, it doesn't like th those outcomes so much because they're very difficult to measure. It's very hard to show that by being proactive, you actually what happened from that there'll be multiple outcomes but it's very difficult to show whereas crisis management's a lot easier to prove you've stopped a crisis you can prove you've stopped a crisis oh we stopped the crisis so we're kind of addicted to crisis management and we're not really as good at being proactive and, and preventative and things like that and then that, that's a huge problem i don't think anyone's got the solution to that but i think the solution will come from the system as a whole involving all these peoples and getting their voices and crossing those boundaries and working across to solve a problem like that and again implementation is the same so we need this kind of social creative movement from everyone in the system things like communities of practice boundary spanning to to, to, to solve these kind of issues so um yeah i i'm not sure who, who will who will do that but perhaps we can talk about that um so thanks um and has anyone got any questions i'll, I'll come out of the slides now thank you very much christian um so sally's delegated the kind of this bit to me. Um, so a huge thank you for your time today, Christian, and an excellent presentation. Um, we've got about 20 minutes for questions. Um, I'm just having a quick look in the chat. Um, so there's a comment there from Christine Smith. Christine, do you want to just go through it verbally and share your views? Hi. Yeah, I was just thinking about what you were saying, Christine, about um, system conveners and the, the, the informal networks and and using those to get from A to B and in public involvement land, um, the, the constant barrier that we find is that 
that time and that resource that's needed to build relationships and to maintain them once you've got them because it's so complex and it's scattered and it's diffuse and sometimes you can't see it that 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 resource often isn't there to 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 do that and um the way that funders are set up for research means that um it almost acts against that that movement that you're trying to do to build the relationships which means that you can make a difference and, and have that impact so I, um i think it's it's just um i'm not sure how we how we change the culture so that that relationship building is valued and seen as a credible use of somebody's time how do you do yeah. that yeah i mean so you've, you've just described really how the system is almost working against itself and yeah excuse me um, a lot of what we do is driven by how we're funded so a lot of research teams are kind of um there's there's things they have to do for the funder in this and and they have a protocol they have to follow and mm. you know <laughs> so i think you've described it well and i'll see alison metz talks about how she thinks relationship building is probably more important than your implementation strategy but it is not valued and it's not funded no um and so now system conveners it, it, I'm, I'm pretty new to this so if anyone knows more about it please chip in but my understanding is these are people that are extremely passionate about something um for years and they will just slog away at trying to bring it about now they they're all over the place they're not just in healthcare i mean um i was on a i watched a, a call the other day with a, with a group of people uh, who class themselves as this and there's somebody you know working in with migrant workers in factories um you know in africa trying to get the the owners and the workers to convene and understand each other and and so it could be in any setting but the, these people uh just against all odds will keep trying to get the system to convene over and over again and that's what we need we need people to be trying to do that in the healthcare system and relationships i think is where it starts and engaging informally where it starts so yeah that we need the system to acknowledge that even though it's difficult to measure like how that's going to benefit us because it's much harder to measure that isn't it much harder to prove oh you know i get on really well with all the nurses and the doctors in this place how do you measure that the impact of that it's very difficult but we all we all kind of i think instinctively know that's how to do it i think so, the other issue, yeah. on, the yeah. other issue is that people ex they, they they won't commit the resource to let you do something unless they know it's going to work but building relationships how do you know if that's gonna work <laughs> yeah it's it, it's a complete it's a complete leap into it's a leap of faith when you start doing stuff like this and you don't yeah. know what it's gonna work whatever that means no um i mean i i you know i talked about like being a bit, a bit rebellious and what i mean by that is just kind of being willing to think outside the box really and so with janeiro and myself i'm encouraging us both all the time that when we do try to collect data from somebody whether it's uh, i don't know it could be a teacher in a school or a doctor that we that we really try to um develop a relationship and and try to understand what their world is like and and relate to them well and i think that does aid the research no question about it um, um and i suppose just building on that um so christian spoke a bit about the importance of the the relationships about within the community health checks project yes. and you know we spent so much time building those relationships with the GP practices, with the counsellors, with the voluntary sector, to the point where now, you know, we're working together efficiently, productively, we're having a positive impact. But like you said, Christine, that stuff just kind of is is, is assumed it will happen, but you don't yeah. get given the time and the resources to, for that to happen. But that is crucial to any implementation work is having the right people involved with the right passion and commitment. Um, but and, and that does take time and it's not always acknowledged. And I think that's always a huge barrier. Yeah, that's a brilliant example. Is that one? Yeah. Um, any other questions from anyone um, on the call? If you want to raise your hand or speak out, um, just to point out, we are the, the session is being recorded, and it will be shared to everyone that registered via the link uh, later this week. So you can have a look at the recording again. Um, obviously, Christian's details we can share as well. If you have any questions or something after the session as well. Yeah. Um. You know, I look. I, I'd be really interested to know. Um. Just what people thought about this and what they'd like from us because um 
you know, what I could do, what I'm thinking of doing another time is a, a more detailed um, bit of training on, um, you know, the case study approach I described. Because I showed you, I showed you some examples there, which were really just one site. But you, we, we've got projects at the moment with multiple sites. And how can you do a kind of case study approach using implementation science um, for that? So maybe that and, and also if anyone just has a project they want to ask us questions on, do email. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe we can set up a community of practice. I, I noticed Sam Debbage is here. Um, it, Sam, I mean, I'd love to ask you, you know, what if we got, can we get a policymaker, a researcher, a member of the public, practitioner all in one room and create a community of practice? Would that be a way to address the system? I mean, do you want to introduce yourself, Sam? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Debbage. I'm the uh, capacity building lead for the Auction Humber ARC, but I also have a job with the Director of Education and Research in a NHS Acute Trust. So that's quite helpful. Um, I was just popping in the chat, um, Christian, actually, how yeah. incredibly helpful that presentation was. But I was reflecting Christine's conversation with you. And it the money isn't where this is in research activity. It's around delivery in NHS trusts. It's around, unless you are fortunate enough to be a member and a partner within the ARC and alternative wider research grants. So I think there's something around engaging our quality improvement and innovation leads in NHS trusts, because I think that's the language we use. And I think we're missing a bit of a trick. So that's what I was going to suggest. We might want to we ask you to do this with a different audience because we've used our own research networks for this conversation and what you've described is that bridge and it's the value of the getting it into practice which doesn't always sit in the research team's portfolio I would suggest and I really liked your idea because I'm also fortunate enough to lead on education I think there's opportunities to think about how we engage in the educational world across academic and provider for placements. I don't know that I answered your question, to be fair, Christian. Well, but... <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, you know, it's just lovely that you're here um, because it's an example of us sort of crossing a bit of a boundary and that you've just talked about get ha me presenting this to another group. Again, it's, mm -hmm. it, I think this is what we can kind of be doing. Um, so, yes, really glad you're here. And yes, I agree. The training, if we could get the whole, every all those stakeholders, you know, even, you know, all of them from manager to, to practitioner to know how at least have a rudimentary understanding of implementation and use things like the five circles model, just something simple. Um, that that would be really good, I think. Um, Sarah, Sarah Lawley. Yeah, I just um, I just wanted to just a comment real just to share because I am um, probably kind of like a little bit outside of all you guys and things. But I joined um, because I've subscribed to like NIHR emails and things. But I'm um, I've just undertaken the Not 19 Research Champion Program, which was um, funded by the um, NIHR CRN Yorkshire and Humber. And I've since become a Not 19 Research Lead for our service. And um, and I'm possibly like I don't know whether I come into that one of those maybe system conveners or something that I've got an absolute immense passion to try and um, improve our service and get more research into our service. And um, I, you know, things are kind of really moving forward for me. And I just wanted to kind of echo what you've said about building those connections and things, because I'm, I mean, I'm now going to the, um, the IHV leadership conference. I'm speaking there about sort of like moving that forward from, you know, just the importance of research, getting that into practice. I'm currently just on my lunch break at the moment because I'm just embedding a, an RCT trial into our organization for the first time so we're on the first day of training for that and but as research lead I'm participating in the training as well to try and because I'm going to be the contact between the uh, this is like a two million pound and again NAHR funded study um so yeah so I'm you know and I can't just just wanted to just echo what you're saying about the importance of you know engaging with various people across the service and just you know kind of keeping momentum and passion and I think for me I do value even though some of some of what goes over my head sometimes it's quite new to me but I do value being able to kind of you know learn and, and be involved in this kind of thing really yes yeah, so yeah. what was your role Sarah so I'm actually a health visitor so uh, I'm yes yeah. I'm a health visitor and yeah. um, and now not and, and now the research lead for for our fantastic. service fantastic yeah. uh, well if yeah. maybe we, maybe if we if we do develop some kind of community of practice from this maybe you could be part of that 
Yes, um, yeah, yeah. I've just yeah. actually developed a community of research practice for our organisation <laughs> as well. And um, there you go. so, yeah, yeah, so we have, um, yeah, so, and, and I've now made contacts with our commissioners. I have like, you know, one to one relationship with our commissioners and we have a research, uh, uh, we call it now the, the RIG, Locale Research and Innovation Group, and um, we meet regularly. And, and that's the idea behind that is to try and get the research, evidence based research, try and get that into practice. That is our like one of our main purposes is to try and get that that pathway into to get research into practice yeah thanks so much sarah um yeah. we've got the naomi russell yeah hi Kristen. thanks so that was really interesting um i'm actually from social care i've got a social care background and um, worked in social care for many years and over the last couple of years have had funding through the nihr to do some uh to do a pre-doctoral um course in research which has been fantastic but what it's made me realize is that I think social care is quite behind the curve in terms of research into practice there is a lot of work going on and it is improving but compared to colleagues that I've met through the health service I think um we're even further behind in terms of using the evidence using evidence-based research um so I was partly wondering whether there is any crossover in the work that you're doing with social care and or whether there's any colleagues that you have that are focusing on social care um and then I was also going to just make a comment about I think one of the issues that you touched on that resonated with me is about the accessibility of research to people that are in practice because if you haven't been in academia um it can be quite daunting trying to get your head around even some of the language in academia so I think that's just a really important point as well that you made thanks Naomi <laughs> I, I mean, Vishal, you might actually be better to an answer the bit about the social care, because um, I predominantly am working with um, clinical teams and healthcare settings uh, and, and with schools a lot. But social care, I haven't really. I mean, of course, all the learning and the approaches is you can use the same. Yeah, you know, yeah. um, but we do have. I know we do on the Improvement Academy, don't we, Vishal? I think we've got um, um, Mal and yeah. people like that are heavily involved in social care. Yeah, so within the within the uh, IA, like Chris, you mentioned, we do work with healthcare organisations and charities, and Sue Ryder and, and other organisations as well. I I don't think we have anything direct links with social care, um, but that is something we are looking to kind of expand and build on because again, we, we see there is that that gap there, um, and like you mentioned, Naomi, you know, social care needs that support and advice and help as well, and the language is always a challenge. Um, you know, working in healthcare, we have so many acronyms. And then it's always a, a challenge to understand what people are talking about. And even within research, the process, procedures, ethics, and everything else, it does add an extra layer of complexity to everything. Um, so if there's anything that we can help with, please do get in touch. Um, yeah, I mean, I think have a conversation what's interesting is that transformation is something that's happening constantly in social care, as I know it is in health yeah. as well. So we do have some models that we use around that, but I wasn't aware of, of most of the stuff that you were talking about today, Christian, and it's just really interesting to to hear all about it. So I do think there is a bit of, there is a, an area for development there, definitely. Thanks, Naomi. Sam? Thanks. I wonder whether the Health, Health Determinants Research Collaborative might be a helpful way forward in relation to social care because they are, we've got two in Yorkshire and the Humber, and we're waiting on outcomes for some the second round, aren't we? So I'm just thinking, Naomi, on the back of that conversation, there may be some capacity and opportunity to connect with those, depending on where you're geographically sat and which ones are now in that second group. But we can I'll come back to that. It was just a suggestion. Yeah. So sounds good. Yeah. Um, there's there's a, just a few comments in the chat. Oh, right. yeah. Um, so one from Charlotte about implementation science is rooted in behavioural science, yet there is little dialogue between the two fields. I'm not sure if Charlotte's oh. still on the call. If she wants to expand on that, or if you, you want to come in with your views. I I love that. You know, <laughs> um, I I've been fortunate to study psychology a little bit. Um. And, and I worked in it one one time, and 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 the, 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 we don't talk about bi biology and instincts enough. And actually, if people's in, if you can get people's instincts to align with something, they'll, to be honest, they'll pretty much do anything. And, and obviously, there's a dark side to that. But um, if that's what Char Charlotte, you're, you're there now. Do you want, do you want to come in on that? Because I, I think that's. Important. I don't yeah. know. I mean, I've just, um, I mean, I've just completed a PhD looking at acceptability of interventions. So we've taken an implementation outcome, which. It is why I went down the route of looking at implementation science 
And yet now we've got an acceptability forum because we're all trying to work out from a behavioural science perspective, what does acceptability mean within our field? So the whole thing is becoming... So, so yes, there are aspects of education science that are clearly very pertinent. But I think we need to, if we talk about integration, we, we need to start at the top where we're all sort of in silos. Hmm. 100%. I think we should get together. I, I 100% actually part of the solution to the problem of implementation will come from multiple scientific disciplines that yeah. implementation science on its own won't solve it I, I agree yeah. behavioral science because I mean it's the, like um yeah behavioral science psychology um you know uh, our behavior uh, change models are you know you could wrap yeah. those up as in, implementation frameworks almost in well, well we, we the, the science facilitators and yes yeah, so we, we do have um Com B is, is is a great one yeah. actually that that's integrated yeah. into C for two, but I I don't I think I think it's it's not still not quite fully understood how important uh, those deep drives are in people's behaviour and um, in terms of implementation, but also complexity science really important improvement science important. Yeah. So actually, if we do this, if we have some kind of research collaboration or community practice, we actually need people like you because people from other disciplines to come. Well, I'm thinking, I think you, you're talking about yeah. all. Let's 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 rebel against the system. Well, <laughs> but, and to enforce it. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. No, no yeah. it's like yeah, it's like we still need the formal system. Yeah, and we it's, do. It's, but yeah. but but yeah, I just I don't want to be known as like I don't want to say take it down. That's for sure what I'm saying. But yeah, you're right. Be a little I bit mean, rebellious. In turn, we need people like you sitting in on our acceptability forum to, to because to us, I'm looking sort of cancer screening. It's, acceptability does not mean uptake yet mm -hmm. that's how it's been traditionally measured right it, it yeah. could be a host of psychological determinants oh that's right yeah, yeah. um I'm brilliant. just um, adding in the chat as well um sally has mentioned the achieving behavior change program toolkit that we have within the ia which we've we, which we use, use on a regular basis and it really does help bring the science into practice yeah. and then the implementation side of things and um, that's a wonderful set of resources we have available. And, and I think, yeah. you know, the conversation, we could go on more and yeah. more with this. I'm just conscious of time as well, because oh, we're sorry, yeah, the, yeah, half past yeah. one bit. Um, we probably have time for one more quick question or comment. And I'll just say as well, any, any, any of you want to sort of maybe be part of a, a meet or, you know, get into the conversation, just email mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah. be great. Excellent. Uh, thank you all very much, very much today. And Christian as well, thank you as well. It's always great to listen to you speak and present on implementation science. I always learn so much from the presentations. <laughs> um, as mentioned before, yeah. um, this is being recorded and it will be shared later this week, I think, or early next week to everybody that's uh, registered. And there will be future uh, lunch and learn sessions and we'll advertise those as and when they are agreed and topics wise. But any questions, and th please do get in touch. Thank you all and see you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.